Hey there, my name is David T. I'm a local middle school math and science teacher, and I'm here with my friend David Munson. Dave, this is your first podcast. What do you think it's going to be? I don't know, man. I'm terrified. I, I, I feel like I could like pass out and just like start talking from past lives or something. Who knows? But uh, humor is important. Uh, I, I'm here to uh, start this podcast to represent my book. Uh, it's currently, the working title is Wake Up Laughing, and... It's um, it's how to uh, have mental and physical health without introducing strange chemicals into your body. Instead, my idea is that you can introduce familiar practices from our past to be healthy. That makes sense. That makes sense. So it's pretty common sense. The podcast is in support of the book. Mm -hmm. Who are you? How are you qualified? How is Dave Munson qualified? to tell us about healthy living. Okay. So I'm qualified for starters because I've experienced anxiety and depression. Nothing worse than a parenting teacher that doesn't have kids. So nothing personal to you out there. But So the truth is, um, I unfortunately, actually, I, if, you had to, if you could choose, you would choose to not have any mental health issues. But at the age of 18, I started having some depression, and then I had crazy anxiety uh, when I went away to school at, in L.A., and at 21, I had a nervous breakdown, this hit absolute, like, zilcho, and I had to w make my way back up with the help of, like, this hero psycho uh, psychologist, talk therapist. Uh, he saved my life. Um, it's really weird because he looked like Michael Keaton, so he was kind of looked like he was like a star to me. But anyway, this guy saved my life, and then I went on to you know I, I came back and found health through exercise and um, just right living. I'm a big I'm a big fan of changing your life. If and I and I heard about this in a podcast recently. Um, this. Uh, you know, very pretty famous psychologist, psychiatrist, actually. And he's like, you know, the pharmaceutical companies will tell you that you have a brain chemistry imbalance and that you have problem. Your brain chemistry is what's wrong. And he, as a psychiatrist and maybe also a psychologist, he would say that you, it's not that you, it, you have uh, you have your life is depressing. Your life is creating anxiety. So. So, so my angle has always been, you know, take control of your life and uh, change what needs to be changed. And, and so my book has 23 chapters, and the chapters are everything from love, breath, yoga, uh, sports, um, helping, uh, being of service. There's 23 different things that, that, uh, you know, after years of really meditating on it, these are the 23 things that popped up that I know from my life, um, will make you healthy and happy. And it's like your formula. It's, like, but it's not a chemical formula. It's a, yeah. it's a lifestyle formula. It's behaviors. It's like incorporating healthy behaviors into your life. Like, like, like my daughter had started having uh, panic attacks on the way to call high school. She's in her teens. She's 15, 16, and she's having panic attacks on the way to school. And that's a complicated thing. I can't just say, well, it's because of this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that led to that. You know, the school, uh, her parents, her personal makeup. There's a lot. But the short story is that my daughter came to realize that exercise was how she would stay healthy. And she has cultivated that, that healthy response to stress and anxiety. So she will go for a run. She'll go to the gym. If she's feeling crappy, she will go to the gym. And that's exactly what I'm encouraging uh, in my book. And I hope that nobody that listens to this podcast ever has a nervous breakdown because it's one of the most terrifying things um, to truly get so low, allow your body to run down so low that it's almost like you're built-in survival mechanism says, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. We got to pull the plug. He is not going to change what he's doing unless we completely just throw a freaking stick in the spokes. And that's what, it, that's what happened is I just crashed. And at that point, there's no 
option. It's like to, I was at UCLA and I was pretending that everything was okay to the point where good friends later when they heard what I went through, they're like, oh my God, Dave, I had no idea. Mm. Because we're so terrified of anyone knowing and, and at times we feel like, like we're the only person in the world that feels helpless and hopeless and you know it is riddled with anxiety and depression mm. nobody in my family had had it and um nowadays unfortunately almost everybody yeah is. it's quite the opposite i mean these days it's it's almost you're the exception if, if you don't have some sort of diagnosis so i mean coming from my background my parents were very stoic and so their so- their perspective was always just don't be so soft toughen up can I have the pen? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so soft and toughen up. And that was kind of, I think that was more the attitude back in the day, especially as, as a man, you weren't supposed to talk about your feelings a whole lot. So, you know, it's good that, that things are changing and yet the pendulum has swung almost to the other extreme where it's like, there's an overdiagnosis now. There's a, there was a lack of acknowledgement before and to me there's an overdiagnosis now. Yeah. But medication um, is not the first resort, right? And so that's, that's the purpose of your book is to help people to realize that there are other choices and other paths they can take. You know, not that medication isn't right in some cases. If someone's, someone's bipolar or someone's got schizophrenia, there might be a, a time for that after they've tried all the other healthy steps. Absolutely. Yeah, like you don't go straight to the surgeon um, when you have allergies uh, or because you have a sore throat. That's, that's your last resort. Oh, I thought it was nasal spray. It was my first resort every time. No, I'm oh, kidding. my God. Yeah, sorry. That's a whole other. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> We're not going. There. I could go into that. So it I, sounds like this person was your your hero. the The person that helped get you through this, yeah, was one of your heroes. Yeah, and one of the effects of having a nervous breakdown is it made me take this stuff real serious because the the nervous breakdown happened because I was not taking care of myself. I in many ways. So after having been through that, and it took about six months of weekly uh, um, meetings with a psychologist, um, having zero pressure upon myself, like part of what led to the breakdown was the, uh, stress and pressure. I was an engineering student at UCLA, super competitive chemistry, physics, and, and all of that. Like you'd work your butt off and you'd get like a C minus and you'd be thrilled because the curve was so harsh. But so part of what it took to heal was to have zero pressure. So I moved back home, lived in my old trailer in the back of the property for like six months or a year. But it took six months of just gentle nurturing and support and reading. Like my mom brought me Mark Twain and Emerson's essays and like Twain tickled my my funny bone. And, you know, and but but the point was that having gone through that experience and realized how much work it takes to come back and knowing I never wanted to go there again made me very serious. So my bicycle was my best friend. It was my ally. If I ever was having issues feeling down, I could jump on my bike and ride like 10 miles or 15 miles. And, uh, and it was kind of guaranteed the endorphins, the boost to the immune system, the connection with nature. Um, it all, uh, it, it, it did the job and I came to count on that and, uh, the side effects are all positive. You know, you'll live longer, you'll be healthier. And, um, so, so that, that really, yeah, that was a big wake up call for me. And I mean, a lot of folks these days don't even have bikes. I mean, I know children who don't have bicycles. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, certain parts of certain cities, it's, not super bike friendly, but there's always ways to get outside and get exercise. I mean, even if you can't get outside to get exercise, there's ways to do it in your living room if you have to. Absolutely. But I think the outdoor fresh air is probably healthier. Absolutely. So, so I was wondering if I should like just jump into some, uh, some of like, who is Dave, some more, who is Dave? We went, we went into the psychology part. That was going to be the last part of the interview. That's awesome. But then there's there's what we plan, and then there's what life what life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Sure. So what do you think? Tell I'm, me about I'm your just, perfect I'm just, day. Well, no, I'm just gonna bullet. I'm gonna bullet list um, my actual history. Okay. You're, here comes your curriculum vitae. Quick, quick, just as quick. This is his resume. Grew up in the suburbs of San Jose. Mm. 
mm, mm. knew I had to get out of there, knew I needed to get to the hills. Mm, mm, mm. So we moved to the hills of Los Gatos, South Bay. I got to spend my childhood and the rest of my life there running in the hills, climbing in the trees, and basically outdoors was where I was. And, and this was another time and place. This is before the, you know, video games and then finally Zoom schooling just crushed the children into their rooms. Like, we were outside. Um, I knew every creek, every tree, every hilltop. And that's one of the reasons why I advocate for spending time in nature. And so that was, I was, I was blessed. At the age of nine, we moved to the hills. At 20 years old, I got involved with my first social justice thing, which was the anti-apartheid movement at UCLA. Hmm. I, I protested at Berkeley. I was telling my kid about that and like Coca-Cola and all those corporations, they stopped doing business with South Africa. I mean, we actually hmm. brought down apartheid. Yeah, right. And yeah, that was a big deal. This is this is 1982, 83. Mm -hmm. And they have this little camp on campus. And um, so in and when I was 27 years old, I hitchhiked around the U.S. It was like a it was a Jack Kerouac uh, workshop that I did for myself uh, hitchhiking. And um, and then I sailed on the East Coast, bought a motorcycle in the South, rode through the South. And the whole thing was every day I got rides, I met people, and then I wrote about it, and I meditated every morning. And so I was meditating, I was walking, I was writing, I was connecting with humans. That was, that was a really cool experience. And my takeaway from hitchhiking around the U.S. and traveling all the way around the U.S. was it was time for me to do service. It was time for me to give back. And the best way I could think of to give back was to join an, or, uh, an environmental group like Greenpeace. So I got a job at Greenpeace in San Francisco um, at the, uh, oh, something, it, it, it was like right on the water. Um, and that was an incredible experience. I got paid to promote environmental awareness and to save the, the ecosystems of the earth. I got paid to learn about environmentalism, which was awesome. At 29, through my experiences at Greenpeace at the age of 28, I met a man who was in charge of a sister cities project, and w I went with him and three or four other people to Nicaragua, studied about US relations with Central America, went to Nicaragua and helped all these different projects that were going on down there, and had this incredible experience. Uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, um, Honduras briefly, and then a bunch of time in, in Guatemala. That was wonderful. After that, uh, four years later, I went to Asia, uh, Thailand, s sailed from Thailand to Sri Lanka, hung out. I wasn't even intending to go to Sri Lanka, but I hung out in Sri Lanka at this beach called Unawatuna Beach, had an amazing time. Then I went to India and Nepal, just meeting beautiful people and just having wonderful experiences. Uh, it all, I guess it all pertains. And how did how in the world did you make ends meet? Just gallivanting around the world. Oh well, all right. So I had my got my first job working for a contractor at the age of thirteen. So I was in the trades my whole life. I became a contractor myself at the age of. Woohoo, boy! Bless you. At the age of twenty-one, I became a contractor, and I was a contractor for seventeen years. Asphalt contractor. I would repair people's driveways. So you would work enough to save up money and then travel. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I I became a bohemian. Uh, uh, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Richard Brodigan, those people all appealed to me. The non materialist non materialistic lifestyle. Pay cash for what you have. Uh, work for cash, just kind of be on the periphery of, of uh, society. That really appealed to me. So, so that's how I that's how I was able to pay for those things. I, I made good money as a as a contractor in our in our society here. Yeah, because I don't know I don't know if Greenpeace is quite paying those bills. Well, it was we were we made good money. We made forty percent commission. So if you could bring in two hundred and fifty bucks. But it's really good because, and, and, and people would be like, well, 
you know, I want all my money to go to the cause. When there's kids out walking the streets, knocking on doors in neighborhoods, those people are the cause. Yeah, they're part of it. So to get 40%, it sounds high. But so you, if you could bring in 250 bucks, you'd make 100 bucks for your day. And your day started at 2.30, you show up at the office, and you get briefed. Some amazing environmentalist would come and talk to you, or you'd watch a movie. And then at 5, you'd head out to turf anywhere within a mile, an hour of San Francisco, and we'd go to a coffee shop, so bohemian, so beatnik, so poetic. We would write poems and hang out and just love on each other, and then we would go out to the turf, and it, the turf part would be like 6.30 to 8.30, two hours of walking the streets in the cold. We were on our way to Livermore uh, when this first Gulf War broke out, and they just called us. They said, come home. Mm. nobody's going to answer the door everybody's wow. glued to the tv set so we march for two weeks straight but anyway okay uh, jobs yes so at the, at the age at the age of 33 i got sober from marijuana mm. and within six months of being sober i bought my first piece of land and having that piece of land was huge because it allowed me to have a uh, a retreat uh, a silent meditation retreat while I built a cabin and spent time in the deep wilderness south of Klamath Falls in the high desert. Uh, that, was, that was a huge turning point. And I, I, could, I could have a whole chapter, or maybe even a whole book of how powerful it was to let go of my addiction, step into my power, and then buy land and begin improving that land. And I would work in the Bay Area, make my money, take my old my old Dodge beater truck and load it full of building materials and drive up to wild Mount Shasta in the great north and then go out to my land and just it was it was beautiful. It it was, and I you know, when you spend years, like a week or two at a time, going out someplace like that and you're in total silence and you have this project I got so, I did such deep healing and clearing. Um, my, my senses were like extremely sharp. Like I could think of a friend and it felt as if they were standing next to me because I could just like conjure their entire essence, our entire history. And it, it, it's, it's the kind of awareness that you could never have if, as long as you're deeply engaged with society, like like I'm super engaged right now, even though I'm a hermit, I'm also deeply engaged with my community. And that's another important point um, of my history. Like I talked about how, you know, everything was good more or less till I was 18. You know, I had, I had friends, I, I had hardships and, and I, you know, social challenges, but I overcame them. But then, um, but but then the 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 thing that really that that really made a difference for me was when I when I finally you know became a parent. So I had bought this property and had this property for a while, and then I became a parent. And the actual point that I wanted to make, to be truthful, was to share where I'm at now as a 59 year old, you know, um, maintaining my health now. And, and one of my messages is like, and, and a lot of the great rock and rollers share this message too. Uh, Neil Young says, uh, you know, it's only castles burning, find someone who's turning and you will come around. And he's talking about mental health. Hmm. Bob Dylan has a line in one of his songs where he says, um, talks about somebody who lost their mind and returned to live mysteriously sane. And, and, and so that is like a message of hope for anyone that's struggling because you can overcome it and you can get to a place of stability even if you've had a slippery slope for years. And I feel like I am an example of that. And so I, I will come back to getting married and having kids because like to me that's like that's the the big life endeavor. But I I really want to share the the things that keep me going right now is I have so many groups of people that I connect with in a playful, loving way. And that feeds my soul. And and, and it's my connectedness with these other people. Dave, you're one of them, being a radio show friend, a soccer friend. 
Dave and I are both members of KSKQ radio station, and um, and we've played soccer together. And the radio station playing soccer, my ping pong group, my ecstatic dance group, my improv theater group, and then I have just friends I can go see and family I can go see, and that is my health. That is that is the I, w- I almost said non-addictive, but actually friends can be addictive. <laughs> but that is my sustenance, and that is my health program, is that on a daily basis, I have every once in a while, I'll have a day where I can just stay home. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, I feel so blessed, um, and I want to share this. Like yesterday, I get up in the morning. I have a nice, uh, I'm not rushed. Uh, have, have being rushed by the clock and pushed is not good for your health. I, I, pr- I promote hunter gatherism and it's also, you can also call it common sensism. Like, like, yeah, ultimately the ultimate goal is to live like a dog, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired. I mean, to actually live without a clock would freak most people out, but it, it, it really is a beautiful thing. Haven't you've owned a farm before though, right? I mean, it, with farming, like you wake up before the crack of dawn, right? You're working all day long. So you might not be pushed by a clock, but you certainly have a lot of tasks to get done in a timely fashion. And you're not just taking a nap whenever you want. So that's an interesting yeah. balance between the two. Like, yeah, nobody yeah. wants to be a wage slave or have to hit the grind every day or be driven by the clock. And yet hard work has value. Well, one of my chapters, I'm glad you mentioned that. One of the chapters in my book is hard work, the benefits of hard work. So yeah, the farmer thing is interesting because right now I'm living the life of an author and I stay up as late as I want. I stay up as late as I want and I get up when I feel like it. I've been sleeping eight and nine hours. I have an artist friend and she's like, well, I don't actually like to get up till 10 or 11. And that's why I don't you know, do what you're doing. And I'm like, I've never even thought about what I want to do, what my body wants to. I mean, I'm a teacher. You have to get up and you have to be there. So it's just, it's an interesting thought process. What would my body actually want to do in terms of how late it would sleep? I don't know. Never, never allowed myself to go there, Dave. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like, I can't even take a nap. I want to look at my clock before I start my nap so I'll know how long I've been sleeping for. But I know, ultimately, I want to get away from the phone 100%. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, and, and the best for me is, like, if I'm on vacation and I forget what day it is. Have you ever forgotten what day it is? You're like, it might be Tuesday today. It might be Wednesday. That's, that's a good sign. That's when you know you've really disconnected. Yeah. But, you know, back to your um, Shasta incident right like you're, you're up there you're being completely um separate from society you're not as engaged with other people and yet it was spiritually deep and growing for you and now you're in a different place where you want to be super connected and have lots of connections so it's it's like you can find mental health and peace in both those things you don't have to be an extrovert and be constantly surrounding yourself by other people and from my perspective if your path is taking you further from other people and making you feel more separate and distant, probably not the best path. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about is balance. Like, if, if all you were was a hermit, I know there's people that maybe live their whole life in a cave or something, or people that are so extroverted, like somebody, like a checker at a grocery store, and in their spare time, they volunteer uh, at the animal shelter. I mean, you can over, get overloaded on solitude or overloaded on social encounters, um, but balance is what you want, and and that's like one of my, you know, that's like a, a good point to look at the American education system. If you're in a classroom from 8.30 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, th- you're out of balance because you're just inside too much, you're sitting down too much, you're, you're being told stuff too much, that the whole the dance of give and take and let's go outside let's come inside it's a problem and uh you know what i hear is what what you want kids to get from any type of education is the ability to think for themselves the ability to ask questions and be curious and find answers not being told the an- being told the answers just makes you good at at taking in information and spitting it back out. Right. So it's, yeah, the balance thing. Which once again has balance, right? I mean, your times tables, good to just memorize those, you know, don't need, you know, it's good to understand them, but there are some things that you just need to factually remember. But yeah, a huge part of school and the most important part is 
expanding consciousness, expanding self-reflection, the ability of kids to find their own initiative, to find their own path and their own passion. And yet I'm not going to diminish memorization because I love it. Okay. Some people, some people like the ones that went to UCLA <laughs> to engineering school, we became traumatized like, ab- no. about memorization. Like I, no. I, uh, never again. That's a whole other podcast. The trauma podcast, the, uh, like if you have like money trauma, uh, uh, regurgitation trauma, memorization, trauma. Regurgit- I haven't heard that one. Um, you know, I went to a college up in Portland where they had a 50% attrition rate. One out of two kids would drop out and they had the highest suicide rate in the country for colleges. So, I mean, I know I can firsthand relate to what it's like to be pressured too much by yourself and by the folks around you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I definitely talk about college a fair amount in my book and, um, I I had a I had a really hard time at college and I feel like in many ways um college is like this artificial experience and it, it it lacks the grounding it's like hydroponic farming like there's no soil it feels very artificial mm-hmm. here's where I see the connection community building something that you want to get to here and yeah. we're talking about education and we're talking about college and that disconnect frequently simply book knowledge or just classroom academic knowledge is not applicable. It's not shown how it's applied. And so I think that's a common thread, not only with elementary and middle school and high school education, but in college also. I think if kids felt that they had more freedom to pursue their own passions and saw it connected to actually changing things in the real world, we'd have much more engagement. Yeah, I agree. I just came up with this idea that kids in the wood shop could be building tiny houses. (laughs) And, and like, so at the end of their project, at the end of the year, there's a, a shelter, there's this like this thing. And, and like for kids to learn, like, what does it feel like to be inside a shelter that you created when this weather comes and be warm and be safe? To me, that's like, that's incredible. So yeah, there's, there's so much potential uh, for education to be, uh, to, 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 really serve the community and the individual and and community building i've been doing farm talk radio for 11 years at kskq in ashland oregon and we talk about farmers and local food but the common thread it's it always is about community building creating strong connections you're involved uh, with the local farm organization that takes kids out to farms and it's it's just a, it's about building those connections and having that that uh, that amazing uh, network and like like creating strong humans and society that can withstand the big changes ahead and and just be healthy and happy on a daily basis. Yeah, and it's not going to be the same for every person. Somebody might like to chop wood with you know Jackson County Fuel Committee. Somebody might like to go volunteer on a farm with Rogue Valley Farm to School. Somebody might want to go to the middle school and teach them how to make bat boxes. You know, it's like we all have ways we can plug in and it's not going to look the same for everybody. Yeah. Dave, I think maybe we should just take a quick break and then come back. We'll be back in a flash. So working with all these community organizations, working in education, you come across so many inspiring people. I mean, none of these organizations would exist if it weren't for their leaders, for their volunteers, and, you know, for their patrons also. So tell me about some of your favorite heroes. Okay. Uh, I, I believe in heroes. I love Joseph Campbell, Hero of a Thousand Faces. I believe, I love Carl Jung as well as Wilhelm Reich. I love both of Freud's disciples. I love the dream analysis guy and I love the guy who says that we are sexual beings. I, I think they're both very true. So heroes are important and I feel like I have some, I have some great heroes. Um, so I have a little list here. My, I have a great story about reading The Lord of the Rings and Aragorn or Strider as being my hero. And the fact that you can read that book and set your sights on this like impeccable warrior and 20 years later at midnight look in the mirror in the bathroom and who's looking back at you friggin Aragorn and and so and that and, it, and I 
when I say that, it sounds like this huge ego statement, but it isn't. It's I'm just validating the power of story to transform generations. So the power of myth, Joseph Campbell. Oh my God! And and so to have that happen in my own life was like wow, it's powerful. So here are my heroes: Strider or Aragorn, Jack London, Carlos Sandino. Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull, Peter Gabriel of Jenny Genesis, Annie DeFranco, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Michael Moore, Oliver Stone, the guy who did Swimming to Cambodia. So I'm just telling you about like like rock and roll stars, writers. Anyway, those are people that are heroes of mine. Who was the the Sandino? Yeah. The Sandinista Revolution. Really? Carlos Sandino. Because okay. I went down to Nicaragua. Right. During the whole thing. No, I, I went down there. I went down there right after the U.S. got back in control by this woman, Violeta Chamorro, ran on the platform. If you vote for me, the U.S. will stop shooting your families. Mm. So that so she got elected with that platform. And uh, anyway, they rewrote the history books. They, they threw out the the pride of, of the man that shook off Samosa. But it, that is a little bit of a tangent. Um, but I appreciate, I, I, I knew the rest of them, but that one, yeah, it's good to be informed. There was a book, before I went to Nicaragua, I read um, Under the Big Stick, which is the history of the U.S.-Central American uh, relationship, uh, the history of that, which was a great book. And then I also read Fire from the Mountain, which is mm. the story of the Sandinista Revolution. Um, yeah, we won't go there, but School, yes. of, School of the Americas, COINTELPRO, not a good thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, I, was, I stood at the border of Nicaragua and Honduras, and it was really interesting because all the buildings were all fine and intact on the Honduran side, but on the Nicaraguan side, they were all blown to smithereens. It was a strange thing. Yeah. A line in the sand. So, so the point is, who is this guy that's writing this book? Possibly it's going to be called Wake Up Laughing. It may have a different title. But the idea is to share things that have worked in my life to make me healthy and happy uh, mentally and physically. So so let's see. The perfect day. So yeah, what, is it, can, what, is it, what does it take? to? What does a good, healthy day for Dave Munson look like? So yeah, so the perfect day. So I get, dance. I get up leisurely, work on my book, roll into town to ex- uh, first. I actually I walk my dog before I leave because you know got to take care of the dog first. We take a sweet walk, me and my little man, my little furry brown boy, and then I roll into town to go to ecstatic dance, which is this group of people that I've come to know over the last ten years, very comfortable with, very dynamic group of like forty people. 50 people and we dance together in a dance space and it's it's outrageous it's incredible it's it's very shamanic i go into a trance it's it's a temple when i go in there i the whole idea is to drop everything and get super present and open up and also connect with everybody in the room and anyway it, it's it's absolutely i mean you can it's, it's just a good example of why you don't need drugs because you can get so high and you can go so far on a journey um, in this um, sacred healing space of the dance. I'm going to put in two cents for dancing every day of your life. Um, dance okay. daily. It's my mantra, dance daily. And I love dancing with other people. And yet, I don't think we often dance alone enough. You know, sometimes yeah. if you're feeling down, you're feeling low energy, put some certain song on and just boogie down. Yeah. There's just nothing like it. Sometimes I'm in the radio station dancing around with the headphones on. Nice. You just can't help it. But yes, connecting with other people, even more powerful. My plan in the future is to um, have my podcast be way looser and like and be able to be moving in the room you might just dance all of a sudden yeah just, just, yeah well just to be like moving around in the room and like, let me like demonstrate. i'm gonna sit here for a second <laughs> i'm gonna sit there and like being goofy um i actually love the idea of making a video of the ping pong group mm. and then showing that like show what what do what do 45 to 75 year old men frolicking while playing ping pong, what does that look like? Hey, what you give my age away for there? I'm only 37. Okay, whoops. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so, um, so, 
I, perfect so day. I, I, ro- perfect I roll day. into town. I go to ecstatic dance, and I have this deep f- experience, and it's it's all about unconditional love. You're in a room. It's a safe place, and you are touched because you know we do embrace contact dance. It's not mandatory. You can sit against the wall and be by yourself. It's all that's all fine. But anyway, I have this profound experience connecting with these people and that fills my bucket there's this really cool book called have you filled your bucket today and it's des- it's made for five to like seven year old kids but it's beautiful and it just tells you that when you give love to someone hey you look great it's like hey it's good to see you whenever you give love to somebody mm. You receive love. It fills your bucket. So by filling someone else's bucket, you fill yours. Mm-hmm. So so this room is so f- full of full buckets. It's crazy. Everybody's cup is pouring over. Mm. I just have to intercede. <laughs> the, there's a Bible quote, and it says, my head is anointed and my cup runneth over. And it really it reminds me of that. And you know, when you take a nice trip or you do something that, that fills your cup, see, sometimes we feel drained. Right. And then other times we feel full and then other times we feel overflowing. And you got to really savor those moments where you feel overflowing because it's not always going to be like that. Yeah. And the, and the idea here is that I'm sharing I'm sharing a day that's that is an example of how I stay sustained, like how I maintain my health through doing things that I love. But sometimes I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to if I want to go in to do dance because there is a minor resistance. There is a little bit of pushback from me because there's the whole social peers. They're like on a bad day, I go around and I'm like, I'm, I go around with my, um, how much do you like me meter going <laughs> like uh, my acceptance meter? Like, Oh gosh, that person looked at me in a certain way. But ideally, ideally what you just, you're, you're in this place of unconditional love and, and it's it's a beautiful thing, so so I we wrap up we wrap up dance and I'm just feeling just so full and satisfied and just grateful for the the connection and the beautiful music, and so that's like eleven in the morning, eleven thirty. I made an appointment to go soak at the Jackson Well Springs after. So after having this amazing dance experience, I go to the Well Springs, pop on my bathing suit. And I'm in the hot tub, man. It's Sunday. This is church. I just dance. Now I'm soaking with my people. And I hit the steam room. I hit the icy cold pool. So now I'm blissful and I'm enjoying myself. And I'm actually doing therapeutic things for my health. Like like, like what turns me on, my hobbies actually happen to promote mental and physical health which is awesome it's kind of, they're endorphins you're getting the totally. same endorphins that, that the kids are getting from their video games or that you're getting when your phone ding ding dings the notification like yeah. the same endorphins but you're doing it from something that is healthy and connected with other people and yeah and the same chemical stimulants that you get from certain drugs you get through riding your bike dancing you, you don't need to do drugs because your body creates them for you just don't make me jump in the really really cold water okay a little bit cold but i'm not going to go vim hoff on you there's if there's ice cubes involved i'm not going there my son is big on wim hoff he just sent us all a video of (laughs) of how good it is for you anyways so so now i'm at the hot spring it's a good analogy i feel like is when you really eat healthy i try to eat grain free because of inflammation and stuff but like when you eat really healthy, your dessert could be chia seeds with coconut milk and maple syrup. So like the, here's this like yummy, creamy dessert, but guess what? It's crazy good for you. And, and so that's like this whole lifestyle thing where the things you do are fun, they're satisfying, and they're also nourishing. Mm. Like there's no drawbacks. There's no, there's no yes, but it's all mm. yes. And mm. no, yes, but. But all yes and all right. What's what's challenging, I think, is that <laughs> how far away that day is from the normal American reality. I mean, 
most people have never even yeah. heard of chia seeds. Okay, okay. You know? So the first thing you do is you get a job at Greenpeace and you learn how to <laughs> hug women that you're not dating. Okay, you're right. This doesn't happen overnight. One <laughs> at one day you were at UCLA, you were shut down, you were surrounded by yuppies, you were trying to tell the people. I was trying to tell the people who felt like the sole purpose of life was to accumulate wealth. And I was on my soapbox going, no, it's about loving each other. And everyone's like, shut up. So, but, so it wasn't until I was, it was, I was, um, it was like the nineties. So I was 27, 28 in San Francisco at Greenpeace. And I made friends with women that weren't my girlfriend. And I had, ended up hugging all these women and men mm. and and learning how to like you know just have friends so so it doesn't happen overnight but i got to finish the day okay so there i am at the well springs and <clears throat> this is great because this is an example of what i'm encouraging like have your daily reality sustain you and keep you from ever having mental health issues but if you do have mental health issues this is a way to heal to to move out of it and and since there's 23 things to do you should be able to find one that you're comfortable doing and in baby steps you know you don't you're not going to go right to standing in the middle of ecstatic dance with eight people with their arms around you crying that's yeah. a great goal it's a good goal contact improv that's a good goal too i i, Ugh. I have a hard time man it's the best i i, I someday it's on my bucket list Thurs Anyways. Thursday nights at 7.30. I can hook you up with that. You'll love it. Just don't make me stare directly into anybody's eyes, okay? No, none of that. None <laughs> of that weird. Dude, that's so weird. No. So so there, so there I am, all right? Now I had my soak. I met. I made new friends. Um, the human-human connection. My book is about, like, what does it mean to be a... a I feel like I'm just, my vocals are distorting. Mm. I, I w but I don't know enough to know. So I just turned mine down a little bit. So... Um, so the, uh, yeah, so a lot of my book is about acknowledging that we're animals. And I feel like the path to health is acknowledging that. Like, and like during COVID, I had friends that were like, hey, we're mammals. Mammals need contact with other mammals. You can't just sit by yourself in your room and get everything you need. Mm. So this, this isolate, the isolate mandate was a, a death sentence for many people. So... So I'm at the Wellsprings, I'm soaking, I'm sweating, I'm immersing in cold, all these things that are actually good for my, my physical and mental health, because they're connected, believe it or not. And, um, and then I get done with that, and then before I head off to ping pong, I have like an hour. So I head right down the street to this uh, seven-year-old boy, he just turned seven, this boy who I've decided to take under my wing as a little brother to be, to show up for him. Um, and I was about to join Big Brother, Big Sisters of America, but I just on my, which is a wonderful organization, but on my radio show, I just said, hey, I want to find a young boy that doesn't have a dad that needs someone to show up. And I finished my radio show. The phone rang at the studio. I picked it up and it's like, hi, uh, this is your friend that listens to your show every week. And there's a, there's a little boy that lives in my neighborhood that doesn't have a dad. Wow. And he lives with his grandma. And I think he would really benefit from having you be in his life. Oh. And I realized that I wanted to do that because I know how big it is. Mm. And, and we, you know, ever since COVID came, I, I did my show all through COVID. I cried. I felt the, the, the joy of the earth that the humans, like, slowed down finally that the humans right, took a right. break the earth is like geez finally take a took breath a and um but my one of my mantras the whole time is that we have to show up for each other mm. we have to show up for the old folks that are isolated we have to show up for the kids who got hammered by zoom schooling and so i realized that one of the most profound things i could do is to show up for a kid and it would be a young boy and so this um this woman, it's like, yeah. And so she lined it up. I went over there. I met the kid. It was an, we immediately clicked. He's like super high energy, very smart. And that's how I was. I was like bouncing off the wall. I had, I had a lot to do. 
and if if I if I wasn't able to sit still in the desk at school for seven hours, I'd get labeled ADHD. Mm-hmm. I never got that label, right? But but it happens, and but kids should never be made to sit in a desk. Mm. It's absolutely against our mammalian animal nature. Absolutely, you know, I'm going to put out a, a word for Rogue Valley Mentoring because they also do um, a similar type program, and there's a lot of organizations, no matter where you live, that that can help link you up because we don't always have the privilege of a radio show to be able to just drop it like that. That's amazing that you could just mention it and that it comes around kind of some synchronicity of the universe. At the same time, I I work with a mentee. Um, He's 13 years old and he loved zoom school. He literally said to me, Oh, zoom school was the best thing ever. Why? Because he's a gamer because he's got two cameras and a Twitch account where he streams himself playing live. Right. Mm -hmm. And so would he rather be at school and having to deal with social interactions or would he rather be in front of his screen all gosh darn day, day? Yeah. I hate to tell you, and this brings us back full yeah. circle to the issues that the youth are facing. When we were kids, we were facing, you know, nuclear holocaust by the Russians, um, hole in the ozone layer, all sorts of things. That, Television right? was we really... thought We thought the world might end, Gulf Wars, nuclear war was pretty scary. But the way that me and my peers rallied was to not become cynical, to not just say, oh, well, I'm just going to become a hedonist or a narcissist. We actually became engaged as activists. And by surrounding myself by people with people that had similar visions and weren't just taking the material route, it's allowed me to pursue a path that I think has, has helped the planet. It's certainly helping this little 13-year-old boy that I'm working with. And so hmm. having those people in our lives that that not only that we learn from, but then we can give that away to other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I realized how important it was to show up in someone's life and how profound that is. And this little boy, he was six, you know, he just turned seven and he's like, Hey Dave, I want to show you my fort. And so we go down the street from his house and there's this tree surrounded by a little island of grass and there's a rock and I see the pile of sticks and I'm like, well, this is his primitive skills area. And he's like, he's like, Dave, this is where we come to remember the old ways. And I'm just like, I'm like, that's random. Are you six or are you 60? Wow. And then he's like, he's like, there's, he's like, Dave, there's a lot of things that we need to remember that can help us today from our past Mm -hmm. out of the mouths of babes and sucklings right out of the mouths of babes and the the truth that they speak sometimes is so wise now i think he heard this from his native american grandpa possibly but i was like dang that's amazing so um we had a breakthrough i've i've known him for like two months now maybe three months and uh so yesterday after walking my dog after going to ecstatic dance, after soaking in the magical healing mineral waters with, with kind humans, I go to see Jace and we made a breakthrough for the first time our hanging out. We only had a half hour before ping pong and nothing gets in the way of ping pong. So we spent the whole time like wrestling and roughhousing. Like he would run at me and I would turn around and I would boom, oh, I'd hit wow. him with my butt and I'd like launch him back across the grass. But we were like grappling and he was squealing and screaming and his mom had to like tell us to be quiet a bunch of times. But it was really cool. We got to the point and that's I think what, what kids really crave is that touch that, oh you know. Oh my gosh, that is, <laughs> my, my guy's the opposite. Yeah. The first time I met him, he had had so much trauma with men in his life that he didn't even want to be touched by a man. And now he'll give me a hug, a full on straight on hug. Yeah. But it's so interesting. Like, I agree. That's what we biologically want. And yet, once again, back to this trauma and mental health stuff. If you've had bad experiences, the last thing you want is a guy touching you. It could take a while. Well, so the the thing that, um, that saved my son's life, um, you know, Toward halfway through COVID, he he realized he had some pretty serious social anxiety, and thank the heavens, he made his he had the courage in his terror and in his his lockdown, he had the courage to go to a jujitsu studio with his best friend. It was really helpful that his best friend was already there. Mm-hmm. So he f- found jujitsu, and jujitsu has saved his life. Yeah, and it gives him everything that a young man needs 
because I lament the fact that Americans, we've, we've thrown out all of our cultural past. We're just like making it up as we go. We're all on the fly. But, but rites of passages are important. And the John Muir School, now the Trails School, outdoor school here, they actually have rites of passages that mm-hmm. the kids go through. So they have a, a wisdom in that small village school. And, but my, 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 actually my counselor, I, I shared with him my concern. And, and he said, you know what? It sounds like he's getting everything that he needs at, at jujitsu. Mm. There's older men who are showing up to be his mentor. He is accepted by the family. He gets physical intimacy and, and wrestling and, and grappling. And he's being praised because he's excelling at what he does. It's, and I was like, you're right. He's mm. getting everything he needs there. So I'm thinking about helping this little boy get into jujitsu. Nice. And, and some, an indoor hobby is so important, too, because like I've got a really sporty kid. My kid's really sporty. He loves to play basketball, soccer, all these different things. But, man, when it comes to like a rainy day and being inside... Those indoor hobbies are just, it's so easy to go to the screen. It's so easy. So it's great to introduce as many, as many tricks as you can. Totally. Yeah. How, how, as many tools, arrows in your quills and your quiver, quiver, quill, my quiver, quiver quills. Uh, well, so don't forget everybody, the power of humor. Okay. I can't, I can't say enough about that. That's what inspired me to start writing this was I had a dream where I had a comedian following me around and I was and I was cracking him up. It was Woody Allen. I'm not ashamed to say that. I've always loved his sense of humor, his comedy. He's he's brilliant. But he was following me in this dream and I would look, turn my turn my head and I'd be like, da, 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 da. And he'd be like, oh my God, I'm cracking him up. And, and I'm just walking around. He's following. Me. He's like, Dave, give me another one. And I'm like, but I would give anything to know what those jokes were because I was just, they were just coming. And, you know, it was all in a dream. And I woke up laughing. Wow. I became aware of myself in bed laughing about what I had just said to Woody Allen. So that's the title of the book at the moment is wake up laughing because the power of laughter, laughter is a universal solvent. And I, and I, and I promote the pretend laugh in my book because it's just a tool you can always call on. And the best example I have is I'm driving along and I'm thinking about something that someone did or said, and I'm like, God, I should have said this. And I, I can't, how could they do that? And I, I sh- next time I'm going to say this and that, yeah, that'll really hurt them. And when I, and so the whole, the whole, one of the big tricks to um, health is, is consciousness, awareness. So in the past, I might have stayed in that state for the whole morning or come back to it. But now I know I don't want to be in that state. It's Mm-mm. not good for my mental or no. physical health. So the minute I start grumbling, I just go, <laughs> I just start doing my <laughs> fake laugh. And it goes away instantly. It dissolves it. That's it. Here's, it's gone. here's my one. Thank you. I love you. And I'm saying it to myself because I catch myself doing that stuff too, ruminating on negative thoughts okay. and, and regrets. And I, okay. when I catch myself, I can't quite pull off the laugh yet. I'll get there some point. But mm-hmm. right now I just say, thank you. I love you. And okay. let it go. Good. So, Dave, we have like two minutes. We got like two or three minutes. Yeah, because we're I wanna watching f- our clocks. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm watching the clock finally. Are you and- farmer? I thought you were a farmer. Yeah, well, it's it's <laughs> part of the media world. Well, the, the the goats need to be milked. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're gonna milk some goats after this. So, so basically, I want to I want to wrap up my special day. Okay, so I have this beautiful, meaningful connection with this boy. I'm there. My initial the the reason I I'm writing the book is because I feel for the youth mm. and the anxiety, depression, the suicidal um, tendencies. ADHD, I feel for these kids. I want to help them. That's my primary motivation. The primary motivation for showing up for this six-year-old boy is because I know how much good it'll do to his life. And then that radiates out. But whenever you give one, you get 10 back. I wish the greedy people in the world knew that. They would all be penniless and they would be so rich. Oh my gosh. So yes. so, so the reason... So anyway, so, th- so now I'd leave my gift to this boy 
And I'm, I am just enriched. I just played with a seven-year-old boy right. for 30 minutes. I feel great. Yeah, and your kids don't want to do that with you right now? Yeah, they're, they're, they're 18 and 20. So I have that experience with, with the little guy. And then it's time to get over to ping pong, where my bros are. Like I was saying, age 40 to 74. I'm 37. No. <laughs> there's, there's like anywhere from, f we always play doubles. So there's either, f if somewhere four to eight of us, we show up. And in a nutshell, we have the most fun. We make jokes. We give each other a hard time. We're like boys. When I was in the choir in town, I realized the boys sit over here. The girls sit over there. The boys crack jokes and like get in trouble. And that's what we did in grade school. And, and we, you can return to that because on the inside, we're still boys. So playing ping pong with my buddies puts me outside, gets me moving, gives me the thrill of this game, excelling at a game that I'm passionate about with my brothers who are also pretty well, um, pretty high level pong players. So there's this whole like, look how good we are and how, you know, that's, that's all cool. But anyway, so there's this other activity toward the end of the day that I engage with, which is a community building activity. And it's, it's just so satisfying. Grown men frolicking, jumping around, being nutty. We, we kick each other with a soccer ball in between the pong games. We just nutty. We throw a Frisbee. And, um, and, that, and, that, and after that, um, maybe I'll go to the health food store and buy some really good healthy food for myself, see some more beautiful people I know, and then head home and just allow myself to relax and maybe watch something educational on YouTube or something before going to bed. Oh, he, he admits it. He admits it. He a does have a screen. Teeny, he does have a computer. Teeny, teeny bit at the end of the day. In small doses. Here's something else I want to say about that. It's not only the joy of doing those things. It is the joy of looking forward to them. Because, you know, totally. as much as we just want to be present all the time and like Mr. Zen, chop wood, carry water, we look forward to things. We sometimes even yeah. like uh, don't want things to happen, right? Yeah. And say if your main interest is looking forward to binge watching your next show or your main interest is, oh, I can't wait to get home so I could check my social media, right? Uh -huh. I mean, you see this looking forward aspect yeah. and also this desire to capture things aspect through the social media and through all this technology. Mm -hmm. And it's good to look forward to healthy things that not only do you just get to experience purely, but you don't have to capture and display. And, and you don't even need to take that trip. Just planning it and getting excited about it actually is good for your health. <laughs> it, it's exactly and then the trip right. itself might suck, <laughs> but hopefully you enjoyed that month. Hey, uh, it's time to wrap it up. And, um, I'm super grateful to you, Dave, for showing up to Thanks. do this interview. Appreciate it. Like you said, gratitude is what fills our hearts. Every time we say it or receive it, mm -hmm. we get healthier. Cool. I hope you enjoyed this interview. And you can go to kskq.org, click programs, current programs, and there's 400 and something episodes of Farm Talk where I interview some very stellar people. In fact, this dude walked right in, I think at least twice, in the middle of my show. He's like, Dave, you just got we gotta, you got to share this. And so you could find him just like no video, but you'll recognize the voice. But anyway, a lot of a wealth of information at kskq.org. And, and it is an amazing, actual, volunteer-run, community-supported radio station here in amazing Southern Oregon, Ashland, Oregon. All right, Dave, thank you so much for letting me be your interviewer. Mm. And um, in future, you're going to be interviewing other people that are going to inspire us and you're going to share some of the local heroes and great stories that are going to keep us coming back. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for tuning in. We got a lot of good stuff coming ahead.